Welcome to The Grap Up, your monthly blast of cold takes on the world of professional wrestling. Available everywhere good podcasts are sold. I'm the intrepid traveller Mark Robinson and with me is the editor over at the Wrestling Observer. He is Brian Rose. Brian, it is March. February has been a cold one for me. I know it's not quite the same in your neck of the woods, but uh, how are you doing? How have you been this month? I'm, I'm doing good. It was cold for a while, but now it's starting to warm back up. I, I was outside yesterday, and I was, for the first time in months, I, I felt like, okay, it's a little hot out. And so that means, well, it's already hot in March. By the time we're at April, definitely May, it's going to be like over 100 degrees, and that's pretty much the start of the not very fun months yeah. of living here. <laughs> What is, like, your house set up for dealing with... Because, you know, for anyone not aware, uh, as we were just discussing off-air, off, off air, you live in, in the desert. So what is yes. the, the kind of house set up to deal with those sorts of conditions? Just AC. A lot of AC yeah. all around the house. Yeah, that's what we deal with every summer. Every summer it, get up, get up, it gets up to 120 degrees. And that's uh, not uh, very fun to deal with. And that means pretty much staying inside all summer and uh, turning on the AC as, as high as possible. Yeah. Do you have like so a... a what, what's your kind of limit where you're like, okay, I can deal with this and then anything past that, fuck this? Mm, I... 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 120. Yeah? <laughs> I mean, anything okay. else is like, I, I, I can't deal with that. Like I'm just used to really, really hot temperatures. It's been that's the rule of the law here in uh, in Imperial Valley. It's it's always going to be 120 during the summer, and you have to deal with it. And you know we have a pool here, so we use the pool. But even then, by but you know when it gets to like 120 and you use the pool, the pool's like it's it's like bath water. Yeah, <laughs> like it's it's not. It's not ideal. You have to like wait until the sun goes down to even think about going swimming. Like thinking so which kind of destroys the point. But. Think in comparison for us, where last summer we had, I don't know if it was our warmest summer on record here in in Ireland, but it was pretty fucking warm, and we got I up to that. we got up to about ninety five degrees Fahrenheit, which is child's play to you, but to me, yeah, I I, mean, I could have melted on the hot. spot. And, and you guys aren't used to like, oh, we have to have AC everywhere. No, we, <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> Ireland and the UK, uh, both are, we are countries that are set up specifically for dealing with, with winter. That is, that is what yeah. our bread and butter is. So they're, they're really, and it's actually, I was listening to a podcast, um, last year during the heat wave. And they were talking about this in terms of, look, these countries, our countries, they are getting warmer. So we can't now just build for the, all right, let's deal with the cold months. We have to now think about how we design our buildings in a way. Like, what do we put on top of our buildings to help try and keep them cool? Like, you know, you know, they're being painted in ways that is not helping. And all these kind of little, little bits and pieces um, that we should be thinking about. And yeah, like we are... 10 15 20 years behind in, in being set up for that kind of thing so um yeah we have a chat here on the on the grab up you are welcome um <laughs> february was not as manic as january um just because there wasn't any vince mcmahon mcmahon news thankfully no, no coups no not yet but you know what we're not even at wrestlemania so there's plenty of time um, yeah, but we do have already reports. There are there are uh, mustaches yeah, and whatnot. That's, that's from March. Yeah, um, but that's... we do have things to talk about, and I think we could just jump into what was probably the biggest uh, story slash event coming out of February, which was the Elimination Chamber. And uh, I want to just dive straight into the main event, which was Sami Zayn in his hometown of Montreal, Canada. Uh, with what I would probably, I, I presume, is like his first ever shot at the WWE Championship uh, in his time on the main roster. Uh, I might this be wrong. The biggest one by far. But certainly I don't his know biggest if he match. has, but I know this was the biggest one. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he the, the moment, momentum was with him, not only in terms of the crowd reactions leading up to this show, but the ratings were reflecting he was yeah. being a genuine draw. Um, it was hot. 
he was very hot and you know the chatter was about like hey should he regardless of what happens at wrestlemania should he win in his hometown and then figure out what to do you know in the the weeks uh, afterwards um well they they went with the direction which was probably what was always uh, going to be the direction which was roman reigns uh def- defending uh beating Sami Zayn. Um, what did you think of the match and what did you think of the the direction in terms of how they got to the finish uh, and I guess also like the kind of follow-up afterwards the next night? I thought the match was excellent. I thought it was one of the better WWE matches in, in a long time. It was dramatic. It was excellent. And you know, one, one thing that nobody really picked up on when they discussed this, the actual match was Sami Zayn's wife at ring sh- ringside. I thought she was excellent. There was one point during the match that I still remember where Roman is beating up Sami on the outside, and it, right right in front of her, and she said something like, he loved you. You know, th- th- a little, little things like that, I, I think are some of the most uh, great things that WWE does when uh, telling stories in, in their matches. I think that was a very great dramatic moment. Uh, no, I, I mean, the, the match was excellent. Uh, the finish, I know people were going to talk about the finish for a long time because I knew going in that, that Sammy wasn't going to win. There was a lot of great near falls that made me kind of think for a second that you know maybe they are going to go in that direction, but they didn't. Um, I think that we'll know more about this in six months. I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm thinking about what, what Dave Meltzer said. Uh, the night this happened. I think we're going to know in six months if this was the right thing or if it wasn't. Because even though I kind of agreed with not putting it on Sammy because I know the the plan has always been Cody and Roman. And I know by the end of that feud that they're going to get themselves over for that match for WrestleMania. You always have this feeling of what if. What, or, you, you, you know, what if we just put it on Sammy? What if we made it a three-way at WrestleMania? What if we did this? What if we did that? What if we just went with it? And, you, you know, there's always going to be moments where Sammy can go back and challenge for the title, but moments like Montreal only come once in a lifetime, and, it you know, whatever they could have done then, they, they can't do now. They can't do six months from now. They can't do it ever. They, if they were going to do anything, they're going to do it in Montreal, and they didn't. And now it's a, uh, you know, it's kind of like a what if situation. But in the end, I, I, you know, I never felt too badly that they didn't go in that direction because I always thought, you know, Cody and Roman is a very strong main event. There's a strong story to it with. Uh, Cody wanting to win the championship his father never held. I think that's a very strong story. Uh, the, the promo that they had on uh, that, on SmackDown last week, I thought that was very strong. They're, they're doing a very good job of building this match, and I, I definitely want to see it. So I, it's not a case of rejecting one match for a weaker match. It's This is a very strong match going into WrestleMania. But... Yeah. Um, the the yeah. the thing i i definitely disagreed with that people were suggesting was the idea of turning wrestlemania into triple into a triple threat because i think the the biggest fear that people had is like okay what if people turn on cody out of all of this and i think the easiest way that you have that happen is if sammy goes into mania as the champion and then cody ends up running out you know coming out of the match with the belt uh, I, I think that that is the the worst case scenario they could have gone with, which they didn't. And they, they would have made Cody into a heel, which they don't think they wanted. Exactly. For me, I think that, and you know, this is not to make this a, a an armchair booking segment, but I do think there is a a scenario they could have gone with, which was Sammy wins. You do the big celebration. You have that moment, a company that is all about moments. Um, or so they would lead you to believe and you do you know like a, a two-week 
program or a two-week run where maybe Sammy would defend it on Raw or SmackDown against one of the Usos. And then you do, you know, the week after, whether it's like a ladder match, whatever the case you do, you do whatever finish you want to do on the, the SmackDown after. A, to keep the rating strong while Sammy is is still as hot as he is. Um, and you you can kind of keep Cody still on the back burner and then in certain in, in for like the last three or four weeks of the program because you don't need six weeks to build up Rome, Roman and Cody. You can do that in three or four weeks. And, you know, you look back in history with the likes of uh, Luger winning the title in 1997, with um, Mankind winning the title in 99. And these were very short uh, title runs that didn't distract or detract from what was the end destination, whether it be Starcade 97 or that year's WrestleMania. You know, you still got Austin and Rock. But you had this incredible moment and, you know, the Mankind win on Raw is one of the, the, the most iconic Raw moments ever. Um, so having this opportunity and this kind of situation, because these types of, like, matches that, that, uh, that WWE get, which they don't they don't happen organically they always stumble into them whether it's punk and cena whether it's kofi Bryan, whether it's now sammy and roman they don't plan for these they stumble into them and in fairness they at, at least for the the first night of at least of money in the bank they got punk and cena right let's not talk about the three or four months afterwards um <laughs> they yeah. got kofi and Bryan right they went the right way with that yeah and yeah. you know they they didn't this time um, and yeah, it is a case of we'll see what happens over the next six months if um, if it was the right call. I yeah, it's not the finish I would have gone with. And even if you wanted to have Roman win, the finish they did do felt stifled. It didn't feel like it. it you know, you felt the air come out of the room at that finish. Um, they it was just it wasn't the, the best execution of a finish they could have gone with but i'm in agreement i thought the match was was excellent um roman for as long as this run has been it's not one that's been full of of a lot of memorable title matches but i think this is you know uh easily in in the top three which shouldn't come as a surprise yeah. roman is a, a solid worker Sami Zayn is is an excellent worker um, and it was nice to see this Sami Zayn again because it feels like it's been so long since we've been able to watch yeah. him wrestle like this. Um, you you kind of wondered for a while if he could do this anymore or he was just leaning Cause, so cause much. if you remember, I mean, he was out for a long time with an injury then came back as a heel. Yeah. And started doing that conspiracy theory, whatever gimmick. So it's it's been a few years. Yeah, and it was just a case of like, is he at the point now where he's just going to focus more on the character work because his body won't let him anymore do the things that he wants yeah. to do? Hey, for this night, he he turned it up. It was the Sami Zayn I remember. I'm sure come WrestleMania, it will be that Sami Zayn as well. And uh, I guess we see what happens, you know. Um, I imagine, I would imagine that like, post WrestleMania, if Cody does win, that the belts do get split and we get back to just one belt on each brand. But we'll see. Uh there's there's many, many twists and turns that lay ahead. Um and yeah, Elimination Definitely. Chamber as a as a show. Uh people were talking about how this was like a really solid show. I thought it was okay. I thought I thought the men's Elimination Chamber match was also very good. Um I don't know if anything else was that memorable. I think Asuka looked good at winning, in her winning. She so did, but that was about the only it. positive of that match. Yeah. Yeah, that was... That was a very by-the-numbers one otherwise. Yeah. yeah. I might remember. Um, but no, I, I would be in, in agreement as well. I thought the, the men's chamber... I feel like the last couple of chambers haven't been particularly memorable. Um, I can't actually even remember no. what the last chamber was prior to this one. Uh, I remember because Brock Lesnar F5 Austin Theory off one of the pods. did do that, yes. Okay, there was that. <laughs> I, remember, I remember that. It was in Saudi Arabia. Yes. Uh, Theory had a much better showing in, in this one uh, as he gears up for his match with Cena at Mania. That'll be for next month. Yeah, no, the, the men's one was, was pretty decent. Um, everyone everyone got, look, got to look good in that. Uh, this was probably like the, the most 
showcase visibility Montez Ford has had up until this point. Yeah, he did um, a cool spot. He did. He did a very cool spot. Um, yeah, that looked terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> one one <laughs> thing. One thing I want to ask you though is the the redesign of the elim elimination chamber we got back in 2017. Um, I don't know about you, but I do feel now obviously putting the pads up and everything is handy in the sense of you know you're saving the bodies of these people from smashing onto chain links and whatnot but there is yeah. an element of danger that is removed that does kind of take away some of the um i don't know if spectacle is the right word but you know like elevating the, the brutality the brutality perfect word elevating the chamber itself so people can get on top of the pods all for it that's good uh, yep. If we'd had that, Rob Van Dam probably never would have crushed Triple H's throat. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. But the chain links being padded up, they just, you know, it's it's just a bit... Mm. Yeah, I mean, I haven't thought about it too much, but you know, when you point that out, it's like, yeah, there is there is an element of uh, danger that's taken away from, from that, but... It's, it's, it's kind of the same thing with uh, a lot of these uh, WWE type matches that they've kind of altered and changed over the years. It's They always tweak things to make things a little safe, so you can't really argue that it's like a bad thing. But it does take away uh, an element uh, of danger that used to be there that kind of made the matches a little bit more interesting. So it's kind of like, yeah, okay, it's, it's good that it's safe, but I kind of like the old design a bit more. Yeah. Um, elsewhere on the show, we had the the, the mixed tag with uh, Rhea Ripley and Finn Balor against Beth Phoenix and Edge. And it's not so much this that I want to talk about, but I guess what I want to talk about is Rhea Ripley and Charlotte Flair. And what are, what are they trying to attempt to do here? Is, is Charlotte Flair meant to be the babyface in this feud? Are they actually... Dave? She's returning. She is a baby face. <laughs> uh, but the story is is that Rhea Ripley wants to get uh, uh, revenge over what happened at WrestleMania a few years ago. I get that. I get that. So why isn't she the baby face? It, 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 the, yeah. So the, but that's the the uh, the bad dynamic here. It's like why is Rhea Ripley the heel and why is Charlotte Flair the baby face? And, you know, I'm sure people would say, oh. well, they could make it the baby face. And then I would argue, well, why have you had to be this, like, evil hill for the last 12 months? Doesn't seem like the right way to line her up for this. But, you know, um, oh. don't argue with the WWE bots. They they know best. They, they should, and Ripley should win that. I, I don't think Charlotte should win that. But I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, uh, I'm yeah, just... it, it is a weird dynamic. Yeah, I'm just looking at uh, the rest of the WrestleMania cards because obviously we've got, still got a lot of matches to be announced considering this is a two-night show. But uh, yeah. we've got... So <laughs> one of the things that people had been talking about was like Brock Lesnar, what's he doing on this show? Oh, God. And there was rumblings that maybe we'd get him and Gunther in this first-time match. And first of all, Brock Lesnar's not wrestling for the Intercontinental Championship. Let's just get that out of the way there. Uh, there was the no. rumblings about him and Bray Wyatt, and uh, Brock Lesnar was clearly smart enough to Ima read the room on that one. Ima imagine uh, Brock Lesnar trying to sell that Firefly Funhouse stuff they've been doing the last few weeks. I mean, in fairness... You know, if, he's not doing that. If the last, like... Three or four years of Bray Wyatt doing that led up to the moment where Brock Lesnar just like trashed that set to pieces and just went fuck this. I would be fine yeah. with that payoff. Uh, I'd, 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 I'd like that. Um, but no, we've got Brock Lesnar and Omos. Um, I wonder who booked that. Hopefully, this one would be quick. <laughs> D does does Omos go over here? I don't think so. <laughs> How old, actually? I, I don't, don't know. think so. How old is is Omos? He's only twenty eight. Holy shit! Really? That... Yeah. <laughs> he has a long way to go. Then I I did not look like that at twenty eight. I tell you that much. Um, no, I no. Yeah. Either. Apparently, he was trained by the Performance Center, Kevin Nash, and Chris Hero. That's a weird combination. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I, I never thought Kevin Nash and Chris Hero would 
be responsible for training Omos. Maybe Kevin Nash. Yeah. yeah teach him how to be a big guy. Do your five spots, get in, get out. I get it. Yeah. I, like, the, the problem is, does Omos even have five spots? Uh, yes, the tree slam. He looks mean. Is that a spot? Yeah. He's got he's got a mean face about him. Okay. Yeah, you would think he in theory. You would think in theory that Omos being twenty eight, Brock Lesnar being oh, I'd say like forty five at this 40. point. It's close. Um, the Omos would win here, but I don't, I don't know. Like but, well, Brock Lesnar doesn't do drops unless it's to uh, unless it matters. I mean, I'm not saying Omos is giant Gonzalez levels of bad. He's not that bad, but no one is in fairness. Do you know what? I might have to go back and watch Taker Gonzalez. It's been a while since I've seen that. That was a horrible match. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It's it's been some it time was. since I've seen that. Yeah. Um, uh, I I don't know if if Omos is as if who is worse, Trent Gonzalez or uh, Omos. I I think I it's think Trent I, Gonzalez was better. I think he you was. think Gonzalez was better. All right, well, I'm going to go back oh, and watch you, that. Not, not in terms of outfits. I mean, Omos has the better outfit than whatever oh, outfit, you're trying right. to go with. I mean, with they the, both suck, but for very, for different reasons. So. They, they, they both suck for different reasons, Yeah, I guess, yeah. Um, But no, I mean, I guess we, we now have for Bray Wyatt instead. We've got him and Bobby Lashley, so uh, Lashley drew uh, the short that, end that of that straw. That feud isn't lighting my world on fire either. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, it's not. It's not good. Yeah, this, this Mania card, it's slowly becoming a, a one match show um like i'm sure um, i would imagine belair and asuka will be an excellent match like bianca belair and wrestlemania just it, it's a thumbs up she she knows yeah, how to work match. those big shows but but the, elsewhere the, the, I, I, the big I, matches are going to be Ro- roman and cody and usos and kevin owens and Sami Zayn. those are going to be the two big matches and you know what? I'm pretty sure I, I, I'd be confident that Rollins and Logan Paul will have a very good match. Yeah, that'll but be there good, is also a very good match. Nothing I want to watch between those two characters up until the moment that bell rings. There is nothing you can get me to be interested in until those two actually I start wrestling. I don't think it's been bad, but I, I think Logan Paul's <laughs> excellent as a heel. The Paul brothers are just naturally not likable when. Boy, have, uh, to give WWE credit, at least they have gone in the direction where they they don't they want you to boo him. True, took them a while to get they there. Want, before they wanted uh, Logan Paul to be a babyface, and he cannot. He, he's just naturally not likable. Yeah. yeah. Even if you don't know anything about anything about his YouTube stuff, I mean, he's not likable. But with that, Rollins is not likable as well, and no, like uh, you know, yes, the crowd. The, chant- the character is goofy. The character it's always is, been goofy. Com- is complete cornball. And, you know, I guess there's... You could do... Because the one thing you cannot say, or the one thing you can say about Rollins above everything else, the man is passionate about this business, about this industry, and about the company that he works for. And I do think that if you wanted to present Rollins in a more serious light and, and play up the fact that you know, like, this is the industry he loves and he's grown up in and he thinks that Logan Paul is, is a, you know, a slap in the face in the industry or, you know, disrespects the industry, blah, blah, blah. You could probably do something with that. And that's, I think, a very easy way to make Rollins the good guy because yeah. fans could gra- would gravitate towards, like, yeah, this is the guy that, you know, is defending our industry, but he's a fucking clown. So, <laughs> you know, and, and I don't think they're dropping that part of his character anytime soon. So... No. Yeah. It's the freaking Rollins. It's it's the freaking. I've, I've never liked that nickname. No. It's so dumb. Um, um, yeah. I don't. None of his character stuff works for me. But you know, it does. It's it is over with the crowd now, which it wasn't yeah, even a few months ago. So that's something. I think they just like chanting his his theme. Crowds like to chant a song. All right, that's that's all it comes down to. All right. Well, that is. I think everything with WWE. Um, that, that I think we, so. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, we'll move over to AEW then, who didn't have a major show in the month of February, but they did have a couple of matches here and there. And, you know, I guess we can talk about the build up to, to Revolution, which it has now passed, but we'll talk about that next month. Uh, first thing for me, the we, we spoke last month about the, the MJF Danielson feud. 
and that obviously followed into to February and really this feud consisted of MJF doing some very interesting promos to say the least and Brian Danielson <laughs> yeah. wrestling some very very good fucking matches oh, yeah. uh, and in particular the Danielson yeah, great month. the Danielson Roosh match was a pay-per-view quality match probably probably the best dynamite match of february uh roosh yeah. continues to be just a revelation in this company um in a way that no one expected and you know like they've already got their money's worth out of him in a way that they did not get with Andrade. so you know g- good work there yeah, tk true. uh yeah just yeah, this match uh, you know, I, I i remember when i heard rush was signed i was like oh okay i wonder how long that's gonna last but uh, to his credit and to uh, EW's credit, they made it work. And he and Brian Danielson had an excellent match. And I always look forward to the next Roosh match. I, I mean, he's he is a very unique, charismatic talent. And he knows how to do uh, you know, these kind of matches. And this was excellent. Just uh, very, very, very good stuff. We start, uh, yeah, actually, so let's carry on with that for a second there. How did you find the Danielson MJF build up as a whole? Uh, kind of hit and miss. There are some weeks where I, I, I hear, I heard promos where it's like, okay, this isn't really getting me, you know, like invested in their match. And then, um, MGF. Was it MGF or was it Danielson? Oh, the, 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 oh, oh, the, it was the MGF promo uh, where Danielson was in the ring and he came out and started to say, well, you, you know, I don't like you because you have a family and yet despite having that family, you, you still go out there and despite your medical history, you go out there and you wrestle each and every week and you do this all this hard stuff and... You, you know, you have a family at home and all this, and yet you still go out there and you destroy your body. I, I hate you for that. That's That was MGF's uh, promo. And then he started talking about his kids, and then he started uh, talking directly to his kids in front of the camera, and, and he and Alex Danielson got into a fight, into a brawl, and it was a very good brawl. It was a good pull-apart pull apart brawl. Uh, that was excellent. That 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 started to really kick shift gears into that feud, and that got the feud really hot. And then they had the go home promo. And that I, I forget if that was in March or whatever, but that still. would have been March, I think. And yeah, it, 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 it was good. It led to the match, which we'll talk about next month, which was incredible. Yeah. So yeah, I, I mean, it was it wasn't all hit. Some of it was kind of miss at uh, times, uh, but. I thought overall it it ended very strongly. Yeah, for me, I think the thing with this feud in particular and what it highlights is the issue with doing these four pay per view a year, the the four pay per view year cycle that AEW has, which has its pros and its cons. Obviously, each show does feel incredibly special because they're only doing the four a year. Um, and you can't argue with that because, you know, there really hasn't been a bad AEW pay-per-view to this point. And each one, by the time you get to the show, even if the build-up hasn't been as good, you're rare, you know, you're fired up for it because um, they are so infrequent. But the problem that you run into, and I think we've really seen with, like, this pay-per-view in particular, is that if you've got... You know, like up to 12 weeks of television before you get to the next pay per view, probably even longer. It's hard to, you can't, you know, you can't start a feud at the beginning of, of the last pay per view coming into the next one. Well, you can try if you want, but it's very difficult to keep that interesting for 12 weeks. And if you do that, or even if you don't do that, and you, you know, start the feud, say, like eight weeks before the pay per view, that's still eight weeks that you have to fill out. And one of the very kind of like common booking tropes that we've seen when it comes particularly to MJF feuds is the, oh, you need to run through a gauntlet of guys each week for the next like five or six weeks before you get to me. And while that isn't bad in the sense that, hey, cool, it means that we have like a purpose for these wrestling matches each week. That's always good. You know, there's a wrestling match happening and there is an inbuilt story for why it's happening. It's not happening just for the sake of it happening. 
And you've got Danielson in there every week who, you know, ha- has had an incredible first three months of the year, having all of these tremendous matches. But you do now, one of the very obvious booking patterns that Tony Khan has, particularly with the MJF character, is this gauntlet of matches that his opponents have to run through because they're running this four pay-per-view cycle per year. Now, personally, for me, I wish that they would run even like two more pay-per-views a year and have that down to two months each. Obviously, you've got like the Forbidden Door pay-per-view that is kind of wedged in just after Double or Nothing. Um, maybe there's one other they could throw in somewhere just to make these f- builds between big events not feel so fucking long. Um, yeah. Because, like, you know, like, Ricky Starks coming, and obviously this is March, but Ricky Starks coming out of Revolution, he's now just jumped into a feud with Juice Robinson, and I like Juice Robinson, but Juice hasn't done anything on AEW so far. You know, yeah. he he was introduced, like, mid to late last year, and then, other than he had the, the he Ring of Honor match for a with while. Joe, he hasn't yeah. done anything. So it's clearly like this is a stopgap to uh, Ricky Starks. I think does this is a next. way to, you know, start to get Juice Robinson on TV every week and make him a viable character. But yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a holding pattern for Ricky. Yeah. But, you, you know, to, to me, it's like, well, I think they have other people ready. I don't see him going for the TNT title. I don't see him going for these other titles. I, I would put him in a world title situation. But I think the thing is, is that he is. Uh, they have other ideas for the world title right now. Uh, you know, Adam Cole probably, uh, probably somebody else. I, I was thinking Kangman, but then they they just decided to continue with uh, with him and, and Moxley. So uh, that I don't think that's happening just yet. But I, I maybe Darby Allen. He hasn't been on TV for a few weeks. That that might be a situation with him and MGF too. Uh, but I, I don't think they're. I think he is going to be in a world title situation sometime this year, but probably not right now. So I would... So, you know, it's a fine idea to have him go against Juice because Juice needs something to get started in AEW and he hasn't really done anything yet. So it's something to do. I'm not saying it's going to be good, but it's something to do, I guess. One thing you could do with Starks is you could segue back to him and Powerhouse Hobbs, who is now the TNT champion, um, because you do have the inbuilt storyline between those two and what I would consider an, an unresolved matter between them to, to be handled. So, um, you know, there's something that they could, they could do. But again, I, the, the the bigger issue here is just because of the, the length of time between shows Um you do have these feuds that are stop gaps that are holding patterns till they get to whatever is the thing they need to get to. Um, and really the, the major issue with that is it just means that like the first four or five weeks of television um, post whatever pay-per-view they're on, they're kind of just like, yeah, they're holding patterns. They're just kind of like holding things down until they get to whatever the, the feuds are. They're kickstarting towards the next show. And, it does make those first few dynamites post a pay-per-view they're a bit long in the tooth because they're just kind of like dilly-dallying around until you know the bigger the big feuds start so you know that's that's one of the things we'll see what happens you would think from a business aspect that maybe uh tk would think about adding a few more pay-per-views here and there like we've technically got the three ring of honor pay-per-views a year You've got the four major AEW pay-per-view shows, and if they're doing Forbidden Door again, you have five. So, you know, it's not like they're not doing... They're what? They're like... There are, there are eight pay-per-views so far. Like, if you want to include AEW and Ring of Honor together, there's eight pay-per-views a year there. So, I guess... I guess they're doing okay. And it seems like the numbers for this one was decent. So, yeah, I'm sure TK knows what he's doing, and I'm just an idiot in my bedroom talking about this. So, um, we... Talking about uh, Moxley and Hangman Page, they had their second match um, uh, at the start of February, um, which was the follow-up to the match they had where uh, Hangman Page was going after Moxley, who was the champ at the time. Uh, Page ended up with a concussion in that match. So this was the the follow-up match several months later, which in storyline, I believe, uh, Moxley would end up with a concussion as well, which is then what led into the Texas Deathmatch. 
this is a really strong just these two have just got tremendous chemistry two yes. tough hard-hitting no-nonsense go-go-go style wrestlers uh yeah they, they, these two could be linked together for several years and i'd have no complaints yeah uh the thing is, is that they had an excellent match, and I understand why they went with the finish because they wanted to sell that. Moxley now has a concussion, and you know both of them are being injured. That leads to this Texas death, uh, Texas death match. The thing of it is, is that I forgot most of this match because I saw the match from last weekend, which was their best match, and it was the most brutal and the most violent match. So. I don't have like too many individual thoughts on this match, but uh, I remember it being good. Uh, leading to the the final match, which was probably the best one of all three. So. Yeah. Well, again, we'll get to that next month. Yes. Um, but one other thing that uh, I remembered from AEW in February was at the start of the month was the TNT no hold bards no holds barred match between Samoa Joe and Darby Allen, uh, which seems oh, yeah. like that was forever ago now. But yeah, um, it seems like forever. Funnily enough, Samoa Joe playing the big bruiser bully going up against the hundred and sixty pound frame of Darby Allen, who just has no limits for the levels of physical punishment that he is willing, like not since yeah. the heyday of Some early brutal spots, not since the heyday of like early nineties, Mick Foley. Have we seen a man who is just <laughs> willing to put himself through unimaginable levels of punishment for our entertainment. Um, but goddamn, if this wasn't the best Samoa Joe match in however long, uh, just very yeah. long time. Yeah. Yeah. And and you get it with like Joe. He's at this point now. He, you know, we were kind of talking about with Sami Zayn earlier, where he's definitely past his physical prime. Yes. But if you get him in there with the right opponent, who basically can act like a fucking ragdoll for twenty minutes, you can yeah. get this still. So yeah. What did what did you think of this one? Uh, it was a brutal match. Uh, Darby Allen. Um. He's like the living definition of I'm here for a good time, not a long time, because he is destroying his body in every one of these major matches. I mean, just brutal spots. I'm like, how can somebody recover from this and then wrestle again the next week? And I think he, he did. I think he wrestled a lot until he lost the title to uh, he Joe wrestled back to Joe. He wrestled, I think, pretty much every week and also flew to Japan and back. Oh, yeah, and he did the, 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 the Muda show. So, yeah. Um, yeah, this is a, a brutal match. And I don't I don't know. How long is Darby Allen going to do this? <laughs> Cause I mean, I he's 30 anybody... now, so... He's, you he's, know. Yeah, he's 30, but, like... And you look at, how like, someone... going to destroy his body like this? You look at someone it's like Jeff brutal. Hardy, who is, what, like, early 40s at this point? Uh, yeah, something like that, yeah. And, you know, that's someone who is very much at the point now where he, he is way past, like, being able to wrestle to any kind of level that he once were, could. Um, and I'd say Darby is even more reckless than Jeff ever was because, you know, Jeff was a fairly large guy. So uh, he didn't have to, you know, he didn't have to wrestle every match like it was his last in a way that Darby does. The, the, th the funny thing is, is that Jeff Hardy was considered small back in like 2001. And now it's like 20 years later and it's like Jeff Hardy's way bigger than some of these guys. But the thing of it is, is, is it doesn't really matter. But Darby Allen, because Darby Allen is a small guy, but I mean, he's one of the most biggest bump takers in, uh, in pro wrestling. Just crazy stuff. Crazy stuff. Yeah. Yep. Uh, anything else from AEW in February that uh, you either remember uh, or, or was worth talking about? No, I think those were all the major programs. There was the six-man tag with um, the Elite against AR Fox and Top Flight, which was which was a solid enough match. But yeah. otherwise, otherwise, no, no, I think that kind of covers everything for AEW. All right, bouncing over to New Japan, who had their Battle in the Valley show from uh, somewhere around your neck of the woods. I don't know how far away you are from the Cow oh, Palace. 
Where was it? Uh, Not the San Cow Jose. Palace, sorry. I'm, I'm far away from San Jose. Yeah, okay. Yeah, All right. A... Um, but San this... Jose. This was uh, the the show where Mercedes Monet was making, I guess, her, her North American debut for New Japan, or her debut for Japan in a wrestling capacity. Um, she went up against Kyrie for the IWGP Women's Championship, uh, which was, you know, a match that was very much being looked at, speculated, you know, the... the the spotlight was on in terms of how would this show do uh, financially, you know, was Mercedes a draw outside of WWE and how would the match go with her having to wrestle a different sort of style? And I think across the board, like everything was ticked off here. Everything was a success. Yeah. yeah I wasn't sure about her debut in Japan. I thought that was kind of off. So I was kind of wondering how this would be. And this turned out to be very good. Mercedes money is very good. Kyrie is very good, and they had a very good match. And uh, the crowd was into it. The crowd was hot. And uh, Mercedes Monet won. She is the new IWGP Women's Champion. And uh, I'm not sure who she's challenging next. Uh, I, th- there is a name. I'm not uh, sure I who it believe, is. I think Azumi. Uh, Azumi is ch- yes. I think is, yeah, yeah. Uh, Azumi challenged, I think, during the press conference or something. And, and Mercedes was. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's the fuck it. Let's that, do it. Let's go. Yeah, let's let's do it. So I think that's the next match. And uh yeah, I mean I thought everything was a success. I thought uh, Mercedes drove tickets. I thought a lot of people pay attention to that show because of Mercedes. And I think that's a positive for New Japan because their stuff in the US has been struggling to say the least. Uh not doing very great uh, in terms of ticket sales uh last year. For those strong tapings, they didn't do that well. And now they're shifting towards more bigger events. Uh, less shows, but bigger events uh, throughout the year. They announced one show for, I think, April? They just announced it today. I think it's in uh, it's in Long Beach. So that's the next show. Uh, not sure where what, who will be on that, but... You know, they're shifting towards bigger shows in America and less TV tapings. I think that's a good direction to go. I think it's a, it brings more eyes to the product because those strong tapings, you know, I, I always heard good things about New Japan Strong, but nobody was watching them, uh, watching those shows because there's just too, there's, there's just too much content out. So uh, shifting towards this, I think, is a, is a better idea and, you know, bring in people like Mercedes. I think that's only going to help the brand, and I think it, I think it's a good investment. We'll see where, I see the other matches she has. You know, uh, she's supposed to go to Stardom soon. We'll see how she does there. How she drives business there. It's it's an interesting move, and I'm looking forward to seeing it more. Do you think the New Japan? in terms of their their north american presence do you think they're going to stick roughly around like the california area just in terms of like the fly-ins with with talent and whatnot because like i remember pre-covid and whatnot they'd be doing these shows in places like uh what was that? I think it was nashville or it was somewhere kind of like more east coast yeah like nashville which felt like it felt like a, a dragon gate us show from 10 years ago in front of about 300 yeah. people yeah. So I'm wondering, do you, do you think they're going to kind of stick more to like California, obviously because of the LA Dojo and yeah. and because of the the slightly easier, you know, getting people over from Japan to, to California than having to I ship think, them to the East Coast? I think there'll be a preference to do shows uh, on the West Coast. I think you'll see some East Coast shows, though. I think we'll see shows in New York and places like that. Uh, but I, I do think we'll probably see more shows, you know, in, in California, uh, Las Vegas, you know, places like that also. So I think it's going to probably be more of a preference towards uh, West Coast stuff. But you, you will see East Coast shows. I think you will see shows in like um, New York, uh, Chicago, I would, I would guess, maybe North Carolina, you know, mm. places like that. They, they, they've gone to in the past. Where is is Long Beach? Is that like LA adjacent? That is cl- that is closer to LA. I think it's okay. like right next to LA. So that that's that's closer to me. I went to one of the shows in the, at the Walter Pyramid. Um, I forget which, 
though. Was it's that a nice building though? Was that uh, not the one with the Bucks and the Golden Elite, or was that the Cow Palace? I think that was Golden, either the Golden Lovers and the Elite. I think that was it. I'm not 100 percent sure, but I'm sure. I think that was it. I can look real quick. <laughs> It was like 2018 or something. It was yeah, like a, the, yeah, it'd be about that's that That's like... It feels like a decade ago. <laughs> but to be honest, anything prior to COVID feels like a decade ago. Yeah. yeah. COVID felt like 10 years in itself. Literally, like, the... I think it was a couple of days before... Um, before like lockdown started happening i had been just i'd just been over to wxw for their 16 gold carat tournament and yeah i think it was no more than about two days after we got back that we we went into lockdown basically and uh you know that was now what three years ago and that feels like it was 10 years ago i remember when when covid started i remember the moment where i felt like okay this everything's gonna change i was watching a young bucks match it was on a dynamite. Yeah. Because I think that was when word got out that the NBA had canceled their season and, you know, stuff like that. And it's like, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> this is serious. Yeah. The NBA isn't going to cancel their season for anything. Yeah. I, I just, I remember I was in work one day and the next day, I was in the office one day and the next day I'm at home. And it's like, oh, right. I guess we're doing this for a while now. This will be fun for two weeks. Yeah. And then two <laughs> years later. Yeah. Anyway. Yes, it was. It was March 2018. Yeah, that sounds The main event right. was the Golden Lovers defeated the Young Bucks. So that's what I remember. You saw that was with. a very good match. That was yes. a very, very good match. Funnily very, enough, very good match. Funnily enough, yeah. with those four talent involved. Yeah. Um, elsewhere oh. with the Battle of the Valley, we had the loser leaves New Japan match between Jay White and Eddie Kingston. Jay White, having just come off of the loser leaves Japan match with Hikaleo. Um, a week or two prior and the the speculation had been like okay well maybe he's going to head up the uh the the new japan north american uh, branch um you know he lives in america now um you know he maybe he's just sick of doing the, the bouncing back and forth and this is just going to be his thing now but he seemingly has left new japan for good um no no, like, confirmation on where he is going. Um, I, I have read about... That, that is interesting. You would think one way or another we'd know where he goes, but... Well, you right, say... Right now, it's it's really up in the air. Yeah, I mean, it, it could be that Ivor Sank has been confirmed, but just the news has not got out, or he's yeah. just playing the cards very close to his chest, which doesn't surprise me. He seems like the kind of guy that would do that. But, uh, you know, it could be a thing that... Maybe he has signed for WWE, and it's not going to be. It's going to be like uh, the Raw after Mania sort of deal, which would be the perfect place to introduce him. Sure. Um, if it's AEW, it could just be they're trying to figure out where they're going to slot him in because Lord knows that that roster isn't stacked to the fucking gills already as it is. Um, yep. But that really seems like the only two options. So uh, yeah, I, yeah, I don't see him signing with Impact. Uh, no. Or... No. Uh, it's AEW or WWE for him. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure which one he's going to go to. I think, I think WWE has interest in him. I think AEW would have interest in him. It's a matter of what, what where he would want to go and what, what kind of schedule he'd want to have. I think the thing with him is, I could see him being like because because you know he's in this position or we're in the position we are now uh, at the moment where you've got more than one viable option um and not just one viable option but two viable viable options to make a fairly decent living i'm sure one is paying way more than the other but you know you take that blood money yeah. and do what you want with it but i would imagine if he you know rang up tony Khan tomorrow and said yeah i'm in boom he's in and that's it no questions asked he's worked with him before he's been on dynamite you know not an issue so i could sure. see him being in a case where he goes to, to wwe and says look if you want me, I want X, I want Y, I want Z. And he's not out of the, you know, it's it's not unreasonable if he wants to say that he wants to make X amount of money, he wants, you know, blah, blah, blah. He could do that. There's no fucking reason for him to go to NXT. That would be, I mean, it wouldn't be the most stupid thing that, that done, would but... not be good. 
Yeah. Uh, I, I don't. I, I wouldn't see the point. No. Uh, he's, a, he's already ready. He, he's a he's a former IWGP World Champion. Yeah, and like the 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 NXT on USA experiment, whatever you want to call it, like it is what it is. That's not going to, you know, that's not going. That's not hitting, hitting a million anytime soon. And I don't think Jay White is the answer to that question if that was a question they were asking anyway. So, yeah, yeah, uh, you know, maybe by this time next month we'll have a better understanding. But it's it's kind of it's it's interesting. It's fun the fact that we don't know. I do like that. Yeah, because we're... Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I right. stayed up late last. I stayed up late last night and watched a, watched an old movie. Oh, um, the Public Enemy from nineteen thirty one. Jeez, that I, is I, old. I Holy him, shit, that, that is old. Uh, but um, yeah, with Jay White, it's like it is interesting because you know when when these releases happen, it's either you 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 know where they're going immediately. Or you know you just don't, and in this case you don't. Yeah. And, and and more times than not, it's 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 you you know where they're going, and you, you, so it's interesting that in this case we we don't. He could show up on Raw. He could show up on Dynamite. And again, I think this I think this speaks to him and like the way he not presents himself, but just the way he kind of keeps a, a, a slight element of mystique about him. Um, yeah. and, and keeps his cards close to his chest, and that's not always the worst place. The, the you know the the worst way to to approach the wrestling business. So, yeah, we'll uh, we'll see what happens in in a, in a month or so, I guess. Um, the the one other thing uh, I wanted to talk about this month was the Keiji Muto Grand Final <laughs> Pro Wrestling Last Love Holdouts. Uh, a name so long that I think they're still trying to announce that. I, 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 for, for all the reports I did, I just put KG Muto Retirement Show. <laughs> gets, I, gets more to the point. It's, it's to the point. Yeah. I, I don't think I am allowed to have headlines that long. Yeah. Um, is, no. is is this it? Is this his last match? Are we are we finally I hope. in a post-Muto world? I think it is for a long time. I mean, uh, I don't think he's got enough time left to make a comeback in, like, say, a year or two's no. time. No, he, 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 his body's done. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's, <laughs> his body has been done That's why he had a, a retirement while. show at the Tokyo Dome. Yeah. And they filled up that arena. That, that, by they the end, he, They had, like, 30,000 people, which I don't think even New Japan did for Wrestle Kingdom this uh, Hey, year. look, this man has done business on the way out, all right? You, you cannot discredit Keiji oh, yeah. for being a businessman. Noah's wishing that he had a retirement show every year. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, if only they kind of put themselves in a position to actually get something out of this after he was gone, but there we go. Um, I don't have much to say about the, the Muto Naito match. Um you, you know That's better than I thought. Yeah, like between this and the Nakamura match, like he's managed to have serviceable enough matches where he's yes. not embarrassed himself on the way it's out. A- I mean the the bar is like Tenru. If if you can have a better mat- retirement match than Tenru, then you're fine. Yeah. Um, and he had a they they had a very good match. I I don't think it was like a all time match of the years type match, but they had a very fine main event for the Tokyo Dome, and I kind of like that finish that they did where Mudo goes up and he, you know, it's like you you think he's gonna go for the moon salt. But then he hesitates, and then he ultimately decides, you know, I can't do it anymore. Yeah. So he gets off, and then Naito hits the, the his finish, and that was a very clever and smart finish, and and to well, not not the end to his career, because what we haven't mentioned yet is that <laughs> after the match, Jesus Christ, uh, Mudo calls out Masahiro Chono, who was on commentary, and he challenges him to a match, and Chono. I, I don't know how old he is, but he is not moving well. He's moving with a cane now. So he gets in the ring with the cane, and he takes off his jacket, and all the people are super into this. And Tiger Hattori, who, who I think was the ref- I don't know if he was the referee for the main event. I think I think he was. Uh, he, They have a match. They have like a one, two-minute match, and Masahiro Chono wins with the STF. 
And that is their final match because I don't see Masahiro Chono doing a retirement show. He's just, he's even worse than Muto at this point. When was the last but time Aaron... Muto jobbed twice in a row? That is the question for you. <sighs> That's a great question because he sure as hell didn't want to do any jobs in this promotion. No, uh, I, I I don't. Good question. Yeah, he did. It's just tonight. it's really wild though when that you night. look at when you look at this show and it was a Noah promoted show. Uh, New Japan is the one that came out on top yeah, across the <laughs> yeah. board in this thing. I I thought I saw the finishes of like the top two match, top three matches, and I'm like. Okay, so Muto's going over, right? No. It was just, here in Japan, have all, all of the wins. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's okay. wild as well, because, you know, if you, if you as Noah, are going to allow your heavyweight champ to be beat... Now, in fairness, he was beat by the other heavyweight champ. So if you're going to be beat by someone... But even still... Um, it was uh, very unceremonious. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, the finish was, but everything up until that, like, I thought this match... It was, it was, a, great, it was a great was, match. It was I, an I, excellent match. I'm so hoping that we get this again at some point in the future, and they, you know, they really build a program into this. But, man, like, if you're going to do this, like, you surely you work it into a way where Kiyomiya was not the champ going into this. I mean, the, yeah. you know, depending on how far in advance they knew this was happening, and Kimi has only been the champ for, what, a few months now. So maybe it was just such short notice that they, you know, like, it's like, if they're going to get a card and he wants to do this, then fuck it, we're going to do it. Um, and look, the, the match was tremendous, and maybe somewhere along the line, Kimi is going to get that pin back. I really fucking doubt it. But... Uh, yeah, I don't <sighs> see it. <laughs> But again, as you said, uh, like he lost it after the Emerald Flosion, which was like, oh shit. But again, it's like as you said, there. It's not even a case of Okada won so that Muto could beat Naito. Like they didn't even do that. Yeah. It's it's no, so. It was a clean sweep for New Japan, which is remarkable. Yeah, would that not tells have called you that. a lot about about Noah's priorities. So, well, whatever. Noah's very much a promotion where. They are hoping to bring in other guys from the past to drive up their, uh, to drive up their business, and it works. It worked great for Kiji Mudo. Well, it's but now that he's gone. It's that and Jake Lee, and I don't think Jake Lee is the answer because. I, oh. look, I, I, I've watched a fair bit of him in all Japan, and the man has never lit my world on fire. Uh, and I don't I, think I'm it's going to happen him here now. And it's like, okay. This is Jake Lee. Yeah, Jake Lee. <laughs> you know? Jake Lee is Shinsuke Nakamura without any charisma whatsoever. Um, so he was like Shinsuke Nakamura before he went to Mexico. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. But even even yeah. pre Mexico Nakamura had more fucking charisma. <coughs> um, wow. So yeah. Anyway. Uh, well, I think that does us for a month. That I, gets I do some... want to add one oh. more thing. Yes. For wrestling, Noah has some of the best production values of oh, God. any promotion. It's unreal. I mean, it, like it, it, that show looked incredible. Yeah, I mean, it's probably like not the best thing for them to be burning whatever hole like <laughs> in their finances to, to do this. Uh, it probably not, but I'm not gonna complain. No, that look that show looked excellent. Yeah, like, and it's WrestleMania level. But the thing is, almost. as well, it's not even just the. Um, like the stage and the production with that as well. It's the way that it's shot and it's the way that it's lit. Yes. Because while like WWE has um, you know an impressive setup in terms of the the production and, and the the stages and whatnot, I hate the way that those shows are shot because everything's so yeah. bright and so gaudy. And it's like part of what makes AEW much more appealing to watch because it just it looks like a fucking wrestling product. Yeah. And Noah is exactly the same as well. And yeah, without question, it's the it's the best looking, uh, best produced wrestling products at the moment. Yeah. But it's coming from a company that I don't know where that budget is coming from. Like God knows what Cyber Agent has to. Uh... Uh, I, I I just assume Cyber Agent has a lot of money. <laughs> well, surely they could use that on I don't know putting a half decent fucking roster together then. But hey, that's. That's their prerogative, not hey, mine. And they want to so. bring in uh, Hiroshi Hase. They want to bring in all these other guys that can, that were names in the 90s and could still 
go, I guess. I wonder at what point, I like, I have to imagine, surely, like, with Cyber Agent, there has to be a couple of, like, money marks that are in their 50s or 60s who, you know, watched wrestling in the 90s and haven't watched in the last 20 years. And I'm waiting for one of them to go, oh, yeah, what, what's Shinya Hashimoto up to? Can we get him back? And I'm waiting for someone to be like, <laughs> well, I don't think we yeah, can get him. You know, that might be a bit tricky. I'm, it's that Saudi Yokozuna fucking question. <laughs> I'm waiting for. God, yes. I cannot... I'm just laughing about that. Yeah, oh boy. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's kind of wild. No, it is wild. It is absolutely wild. Um, but yes, that is a, an excellent point. Um, I don't know what's next for Noah. I, 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 I'm I guessing uh, at some point they're going to build up to Jake Lee as a challenger. I don't know if that's been announced yet. Um, but yeah, it is kind of like, well, okay, what, what next for Noah now? Like, you haven't got Muto anymore. Your heavyweight champion just lost to the heavyweight champion of New Japan. So... Like, I really like their junior heavyweight champion. I think him and uh, Hiromu... Her- her- you know, I've seen him the match. past couple of... You know, I saw him at the uh, the New Japan versus Noah show, and he looked good there, and he, and he looked good against Hiromu Ta- Takashi at uh, the show. He, yeah. He's just very good. Yeah, but uh, it, that's it. That's, <laughs> that's, that's all he's, they've he's, got. He's... Very good. Like, they haven't even got Satoshi know. Kojima anymore. He's, he's back in yeah. New Japan now, he's... so... Yeah, he was, and he, he wasn't was exactly, exactly the answer to their problems. No. But you know what? They have a, a lot of those New Japan dad types. They're just not being booked right now. So they could use them, but Kojima left. Tenzon, I, I don't think, is can do stuff any much stuff anymore. Uh, usually they got us the Triple Crown champion. So, I don't think he's gonna go to Noah. Yeah, that he certainly is. Uh, which he, in fairness, he and uh, he and uh, Miyahara had a very good match. It was an excellent match. That, like, look, that. Miyahara is. I want Miyahara in a uh, uh, a G one at some point. I don't care how yeah. it happens. I don't give give a fuck what the relationship is between New Japan and All Japan at this point. Get Miyahara in a G one. Get him doing something of relevancy, please. Yeah. Yeah. They need yeah. somebody to spice up that G one line up every year him actually like Miyahara he had that he also had the match with uh, Yuma Aoyagi, uh earlier in the month which was probably actually like the best match that happened in February uh, <coughs> I'd really recommend uh, people finding that that was the where was that on 2-4 uh, Excite Series 2023 the first night um, yeah uh, Kenta Miyahara and I Yuma think I did Aoyagi. hear about that match that's that that he match all- fucking rocked yeah. I think with all Japan is it's it kind of falls into the category of stardom for me in that I I don't have a lot of time to watch it unless I hear it's really good. Well, it's kind of they're sort of the equivalent of Impact at the moment. That even if it's really good, they're so fu- They are they are not on the island of relevancy. That no is buzz. their problem. So yeah, that's a promotion that has no buzz. No, no. Um, it's unfortunate, but but I hey, they made it fifty years. They did, so, you know. Kind of. Well They've been split off, like, in two or three different ways, but they're still there. This this ain't your daddy's All Japan, I'll tell you that much. No, this, is, this is Baba's All Japan, All Japan. No, I've been watching a bunch of, like, uh, late early 90s All Japan recently, because All Japan, in general, is a complete blind spot for me. Um, yeah, it like, kind of know, is, too, for me. Yeah, most I, of my... I've seen some of the biggest Misawa matches, but I haven't seen, like, a lot of stuff. Yeah, most of my Japan consumption is like the Bushi Road era of New Japan, the mid two thousands of Noah, and like the last couple of years of Noah. My, my Japanese knowledge it mostly consists of New Japan two thousand twelve to present. Yeah, yeah. I, I watched I, I think a lot. I watched people. some stuff, but not a lot. Yeah, same. Thankfully, we're in an era where because I for me. The first exposure that I got to Japanese wrestling properly, I'd say. Uh, so we had uh, a channel over here in the UK, an island called the Wrestling Channel. And they would show, uh, I think it was like on Sundays, they would do like a three-hour super show where they would just show different matches from different promotions that weren't WWE, obviously. Uh, and I remember, I'm pretty sure like the first Japanese promoted show, I want to say it was the Destiny... 05 Noah show and I, I think it was the Kabashi and um, uh, uh, Ken Su- uh, Su- oh, fucking um, the chop match 
Jesus, I can't remember. Uh, Kensuke Sasaki. That's the one. I can never remember his I've name. I've heard about that match. Yeah. Uh, that, 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 if you've never seen the match, I would recommend going out of your way to see that one. Um, and yeah, that was that was the first kind of thing where I was like, wow, this is insane. So one of the things I did around that period is I got from uh, IVP videos or IV videos. I can't remember what they're called exactly. Uh, um, they're still on Twitter, I believe. But uh, I, 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 I subscribe to them every month to their Patreon. Yeah, I I that there's good stuff. I've not used him in forever because the internet is what it is now. That's, but that's true. The two things that I ordered from them was a best of Owen Hart in New Japan and um, the entire uh, uh, title defense history of Kenta Kabashi, the legendary run from 03 to 05. Oh, yeah. I got that on DVD and I just blitzed through that in about two days. Um, and that was my kind of that's, formal that's... introduction to Japanese wrestling. That's uh, probably one of the most iconic title runs of all time. So yeah, yeah. God bless Kabashi. Yeah. Maybe no one will try and get him back. I. Yeah. <laughs> My earphones just died. Oh no! Can you still hear me? I can, but now okay. it's like on a speaker. Okay. All right. Well, we that's you know we're we're at the end of this show now, so it's. Uh, that's a perfect time for us to to end here. But before we fully, finally uh, wrap up, uh, Brian, first of all, I will ask you who your wrestler of February 2023 was. Uh, Sami Zayn. I thought, I thought he did a great job building that match, and then they, he, they had the match, and it was an excellent match. And uh, even though he lost, I still think he's one of the biggest baby faces in WWE right now, so... Uh, to me, it's pretty uh, easy. It's, it's Sami Zayn. Uh, for me, I am, as like a kind of last minute reminder there, and I didn't mention him earlier, uh, but I will go with Kento Miyahara. Um, between the two Triple Crown title matches he had, he was also in uh, a six-man tag, actually, on the, the Muto uh, retirement show. And... I, I'm not like the biggest in terms of my knowledge of Miyahara, but I have to imagine this is one of the bigger audiences that he's ever been in front of. And I thought that Miyahara on that sort of stage, he looks so natural. He looks like a natural fit in front of 30,000 people. So I'm hoping again. He is a main event level talent, but his problem is he's in a promotion where nothing's going on. Nothing's really buzzing. And he's kind of stuck there. I mean, there, there's yeah. no real uh, avenue for him to go elsewhere until he decides to leave that company. And uh, I don't know. No, he yeah. when he's there, he's he's obviously the biggest deal. He's the biggest talent there. But you know, if he go if he if he goes somewhere else, he'll be a big deal. He'll be a big star. But until then, he's just kind of stuck. Unfortunately, so. Um, your promotion of February? Probably WWE. I mean, they're, they're pretty hot right now. Uh, even though with, with the Elimination Chamber main event stuff, uh, they're very hot right now. There's been good promos. There's been good matches on, on weekly television. It's feeling like a very strong product heading into WrestleMania, and... And you don't see this with WWE very often, so it's, it's kind of crazy for me to even suggest this, but WWE is on a hot streak right now heading into WrestleMania, so I'd go with them. I am going to go with New Japan. Um, they actually had quite a few things over the month of February that we didn't mention. There was the start of the new beginning in Sapporo. Uh, you had some excellent matches on there. You had Duki and Kanemura against Akira and TJP. That was a tremendous tag match. Uh, Osprey and Taichi were was excellent. Um, Tom Hironishi and Zack Saber Jr. can't have a bad match. It's in, it's impossible for those two to have a bad match. Um, you obviously had the Battle in the Valley uh, show that we spoke about, and then there was also the Fantastic Mania tour that ran through February and the beginning of March. Um, that was re like probably the best one of those they've done in a while, and this was the first tour obviously they've done kind of post COVID. But that tour had felt quite throwaway for the last couple of years. Like, nothing really worth kind of yeah, mentioning. Yeah, like, I'd watch those shows, and it's like, okay, that's, it's kind of cute. They're, they're kind of getting to the theme, and 
you know, there's Ultimo Guerrero, and you know, there's all these great. But I don't know if Virus did anything this year. I remember watching Virus, and I liked him. I don't think he was on this tour. I don't remember seeing him. But no, there, there, there are a bunch of matches. There's a lot of great talent on that show, and they, they always come off, you know, working really hard for a for a new audience, and they get over it. You know, it's it's a fun show, but it's like it's it's it can be skippable. Yeah. And yeah. especially now where there's just too much stuff going on every day anyway. Yeah, yeah. But I, I've got... Um, I have three matches uh, on my notebook, but the one of note, the, they usually, I think, I think every tour they end the tour with um, the CMLL World Welterweight title, or one of their title matches anyway. You know, the most interesting thing about this, is I thought they would headline with a Volador Rocky Romero match, since that's kind of a hot thing going on right now, and they did not. Well, I don't think Rocky's in Japan at the moment, so... Yeah, uh, maybe he's busy with St. Kels, but no, they, they finished with uh, Sobonara Jr. and Titan, uh, which was a really good match. Uh, I went four and a quarter. Uh, so yeah, uh, New Japan had a, just a really strong February overall. Um, but also, finally, for you, lastly, what was your match of February? It would be Sammy and Roman. Uh, I thought that was a really excellent, dramatic match. And um, just... Really, really, really great storytelling and great wrestling. You know, I, it, the, it, the finish that a lot of people didn't like, and I can see that. And and I think what you said earlier about it not being, like, the best finish to do, I, I, I agree with that. But I thought everything leading to the finish was excellent. So um, that's the match that I'm going to remember the most from this month. So it, it's a very easy pick for, for me. For me, I will, as just mentioned there, Yuma Ayogi and Kenta Miyahara. Uh, I went four and three quarters. You could come into this match and not know anything about All Japan, the current state of the Triple Crown title, or anything about these two wrestlers. And they have a uh, a presence about them, particularly Miyahara, that you will get drawn in. And like the close interest of this match is, is just phenomenal. Um and uh yeah if if you are able to get your hands on this i'd say it's really worth really really worth checking out take take the half hour out of your time and just uh give this one a watch so um yeah that's it for me and that is it for another month of the grab up here as always uh you can find us uh on the podcasting networking look for links to the cast uh, and you will find our monthly grab up shows on that network um we will be back in march which i'm sure will be a very busy month we've already had revolution um and and there's a lot to talk about with that show so well we won't get to mania but i am going to go to mania are you you are going to mania i mean you know it makes sense i got my credential this week so i'm gonna go fantastic planning on going to ring of honor and to WrestleCon because one of the <sighs> things i wanted to see is a vikingo i want to see vikingo live that's 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 cool that is very cool oh man i haven't even looked at uh kind of like outside of wrestlemania i i, I feel like post covid and um, the, the the excess that has become wrestling outside of wrestlemania during wrestlemania weekend has just gotten completely insane and it's it's very hard to kind of keep up with everything that happens over over those four or five days now. So yeah, uh, it's, good it's, luck it's to you. It's going to be a lot, but I am going to go out of my way to have fun. It's uh, it's, it's one of those we weekends where it's like there's just so much stuff to do, and it's going to be very fun. I think I think I am going to have fun. So we'll... I hope you do. I hope you do. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be cool. It's uh, have you spent like much time in LA before? I've been there a few times, not like extensively. I last time I went was actually I was, I was going to go to Dynamite in LA uh, last month or something, and that didn't happen because of weather. But before that, I went to a New Japan show, uh, the show in front of the uh, LA Coliseum, Los Angeles Coliseum. Uh, I think Tanahashi was there. I think it was Tanahashi and Lance Archer. It was like back in like 2021. It was it was a while ago. Okay. It was like one of the first shows I went to after COVID. So I was excited to go and I went and I, it was fun. 
But I haven't been to LA like too much, but I've been there a few times. Well, uh, I look forward to hearing about that. Obviously, that will be that will be in May. I guess we we will get to that. But I'm sure I'll see your tweets. You can follow Brian at br26. Uh, I'm I'm sure you'll hear and read lots from him. That's if Twitter doesn't break again during that time. But you know, every morning I wake up and I see has is is it, done because <laughs> it keeps firing people people that sound important. I I just. I can't. I can't with him. Enjoy anyway, it anyway. last. Yeah. Hey, join me on Twitter at Lithium Project, Brian at BR26. This is another installment of The Grapple. Thank you very much for listening, and we will see you again next month.